Good evening. It is my privilege to introduce physician, author, and congressman Dr. Ron Paul. Dr. Paul has served in the House of Representatives for over 20 years and is one of our nation's leading defenders of free markets, limited government, and strong families. Born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, one of Dr. Paul's earliest achievements was becoming the high school state champion of the 220-yard dash. A graduate of Duke Medical School, Dr. Paul's career was originally focused on medicine. He served as a flight surgeon in the United States Air Force and has delivered over 4,000 babies over the course of his medical career. An expert on financial policy, Congressman Paul is currently serving as chairman of the Financial Services Subcommittee on Domestic Monetary Policy. From this position, he works to cut out of control spending, reduce taxes, and defend the Constitution. Congressman Paul has run for president in both 1988 and 2008. His 2008 campaign enjoyed heavy support from college students and has attracted both national and worldwide attention when, in which he raised over $35 million and was able to claim 35 delegates. In addition to his many medical and political achievements, Dr. Paul is a New York Times best-selling author of several books and will soon be releasing a new work entitled Liberty Defined. Finally, Congressman Paul is the honorary chairman of Campaign for Liberty, a national organization dedicated to promoting and defending individual rights, upholding the Constitution, protecting free markets, and promoting a strong pro-American foreign policy. And now it is my pleasure to present to you Dr. Ron Paul. married to our granddaughter, so Jesse. <laughs> but it is real nice to be here, and uh, it's a great place to come when people would like to hear about ideas, and I've been interested in that for a long time, and uh, the su su uh, suggested topic for tonight would uh, be uh, to deal with monetary policy. Uh, well, that's an easy subject. Monetary policy is pretty interesting because uh, it involves everything. You know, you, you have to deal with foreign policy if you're going to talk about monetary policy because it costs money. And every war that's ever been fought has been fought through inflation, destruction of a currency. So uh, could it be possible that we're doing that again? And also, if you have uh, a domestic policy of welfareism, well, that costs money too, and how do you finance it? Uh, well, the Federal Reserve and the monetary policy is very much involved. But I might just tell you for a minute how I got interested in, in, uh, in these ideas. Uh, I wasn't much interested in politics uh, in, uh, when I was in high school or in college. I think the only thing that, the only time I was interested in politics in college is in 1956 is when there was a Suez Canal crisis and I got worried I was going to get drafted. And I was so happy that Eisenhower said, no, let's leave it alone, we're not going over there, we've had enough war, and, and I agreed with that. So I was fortunate that I didn't get drafted for 56 and taken out of college. But just a few years later, in 1962, during the Cuban crisis, I was taken out of my medical training and um, put, put into the military. Matter of fact, that ended up with me serving in the military for five years. But it was during probably medical training uh, that uh, s some of my extra time was spent uh, studying and reading economics. It just seemed to fascinate me that uh, uh, there was another, another explanation of economic policy uh, other than what I had been taught in college. And that was my introduction to Austrian free market economics. And I had come across a book by Hayek. And uh, that was the road to serfdom. And that, to me, just fascinated me and encouraged me to study and read on economic policy. But in uh, 1971, uh, the event that was predicted by the Austrian economists, that the gold standard would break down because there was such abuse and the Bretton Woods wouldn't last. So even if the Bretton Woods was established in, in New Hampshire, it was not long enduring because it broke down because it was deeply flawed. 
And that was the end of any link of our dollar to gold in 1971. Now, my motivation then was um, to, to speak out because this was such a confirmation of what uh, free market economists, hard money people had predicted, and lo and behold, it came. The, mon the monetary system collapsed, and we had a bad decade. We had stagflation, high inflation rates, and very bad economy. But what bothered me the most at the time was the day after it was announced. It was announced on a Sunday night. It was August 15, 1971. The day after, everybody loved it. Chamber of Commerce has loved it. And it was a closing the gold window, wage and price controls, high tariffs uh, on, 10% tariffs on every bit of imports, absolutely opposite of everything the free market would want us to do. But the Chamber of Commerce loved it and the stock market loved it. And I thought, well, there's something awfully bizarre about what's going on. We really are going in the wrong direction. So that was when I decided I would just speak out. And, you know, the vehicle for me was to speak out in a uh, political sense, in, in, a, in a congressional race. But I felt very comfortable about doing that because uh, uh, I knew that not much would come up and I would get to talk and I could keep practicing medicine. But my wife had warned me. She says, you shouldn't mess around with that. She says, that could be dangerous. I said, well, how could it be dangerous? She said, you might end up getting elected doing this stuff. <laughs> But uh, I assured her that would not be possible. <laughs> because I was uh, not going to play the role of the Santa Claus, what do you want, here he is, and don't worry about the spending. And, and I really didn't have confidence. Uh, I was cynical and thought that there wouldn't be anybody out there that would listen to that message. And she was less cynical and thought uh, maybe they would respond in a positive way. So uh, that's one danger you have. You put your name on a ballot, you, you have a risk there, you might get elected, so you have to be a little bit careful. But uh, anyway, it did uh, lead to uh, a double career for me. Because although I was in Congress for uh, four terms in the late 70s, early 80s, I was restless and frustrated and went back home and wanted to practice medicine and did that for 12 years. And then got interested again because I was still fascinated with how monetary policy affected about everything that we do. It's not that monetary policy is the most important issue for me, because liberty is my most important issue. My goal in life is to do whatever I can to preserve that entity called liberty, which is what I believe made this country great, because we had been given the maximum amount of liberty of any country before. And believe me, I think if we would have followed the direction of our Constitution and protected our liberties, we'd be a lot better off today. But when you think about uh, defending liberty, we can look to our Constitution. It's pretty darn good. But you know, I, I've actually decided that uh, the document itself is secondary. It's good to have a document. We should have the rule of law, and we should be very keen on following the rule of law. But we have a, a, a document called the Constitution. Everybody goes to Congress. Everybody takes the same oath. And it seems like nobody knows what they're doing, you know. Everybody takes the same oath. And it's strange. Most of them believe they're following the Constitution. You know, today, you know, with the, uh, the new Congress, there's a new, new rule that anytime you pass a, a law today, anytime you introduce legislation, you have to cite the, cons the portion of the Constitution that you get the authority to do what you're doing. It doesn't help. <laughs> You know, they cite the general welfare clause. <laughs> oh, we can do anything we want under the general welfare clause. Oh, the interstate commerce clause. What have they been doing with that? The interstate commerce, anything you want. And uh, then, then they all cite uh, the uh, end of Article 1, Section 8. They list the things we're allowed to do. They don't pay a lot of attention to that. But at the end, it says, you can write any law necessary and proper to enforce Article 1, Section 8. But no, they dissect that out, and they say, well, we're writing this law because it's necessary and proper to do so. So the, co the Constitution hasn't restrained people uh, from doing what, what we've ended up with. We go to war without declaration. We have a welfare state that's not authorized in the Constitution. We have a monetary system that disobeys flagrantly, you know, the, the Constitution. So it hasn't worked. And... Um, and I think uh, it was Adams that said that, you know, this, it won't work unless you have a moral people. And uh, if you have 
um, a, an immoral people who will send individuals to Washington and they're tolerated to not follow the laws, the, the, the Constitution won't do us any good. But uh, I think we've reached this point, but what I see happening right now is a growing number of people that are concerned are starting to say, we've had enough and we should have a different approach and we can't let people go along and say the, uh, the Constitution is a breathing, living document and we have to adapt it, but don't bother to amend it. Just do whatever you want and justify it because it's so necessary and we don't have time to uh, amend the Constitution. I think about the war issue especially uh, on, on the constitutional issue. That's something I've worked on for so many years of saying, no, there's too many, too many, and why are we doing this? I mean, I was aware of World War II. I was aware of the Korean War. Teachers uh, left our school and didn't come back, and then there was the Vietnam War. And during that decade, I was in service. I didn't go to Vietnam. And Korea was undeclared. Vietnam was undeclared. And we fight wars constantly. And who, who starts the wars? I mean, where's the authority come from? Where's it supposed to come from? supposed to come from the people through their Congress and there's supposed to be a vote for a declaration of war. And I I've, didn't like what happened in Vietnam. I ended up being in Congress when uh, we were getting ready to go into uh, Iraq. And it was very important to me that uh, I do what I could to hold the Congress accountable. So I was on the International Relations Committee, as I am now, and they were debating this resolution to give the authority to the president to do this. So I introduced a resolution uh, to declare war uh, in the committee. And uh, I said that I'm not going to vote for the war, but we should, if you want to go to war, you should declare the war. Get everybody behind the war, and we'll all come together, the people behind it, and get it over with. And, uh, of course, nobody voted for it. And they said, that, and the chairman of the committee at that time said that, he says, Congressman Paul, he says, you should ignore that because that part of the Constitution is an anachronism. <laughs> we don't follow that anymore. And I got to thinking, that's about the way they look at, they look at the whole Constitution. Maybe uh, the gold and silver or legal tender uh, provision is anachronism. We don't follow, and that's for sure. <laughs> so it is the lack of respect for the rule of law and sending people there that either don't understand uh, what the Constitution is supposed to mean, or they don't have the character to, to follow it. And we've ended up with a mess. We've ended up with constant war and constant escalating expansion of the welfare state, and we're flat out broke. You know, the technical declaration of a country that's bankrupt is when you can't honor your commitment in money. So we were technically insolvent in August of 1971. But because there has been a tremendous amount of trust placed in us, placed in our, uh, in our money and our wealth and our military, people have, instead of rejecting it and demanding we go back to sound money, they, the, the world took it and converted and said the dollar, even though it's not backed by gold, will use it as for gold instead. And people take the paper money and they put it in central banks, they use it as a reserve, and it has given us a chance to live way beyond our means. There is nothing to hold us in check. So when you're tempted to blame all those foreigners for doing stuff to us, there's a lot of responsibility right on us because we have been spending too much money. And then when we come up short, we say, print up the money, and as long as they take that counterfeit money, the better it is for us. So we have had pretty good wealth uh, you know, in the last 40 years, but not in the last 10. The wealth in this country has been going down for 10 years. But even at the end of the gold standard in 71, there was still a lot of wealth, uh, wealth created. But now the debt is so great, the, the same old cliches and the same old policies of getting out of a recession by spending more money, you know, and printing more money, and the business climate picks up again, it's not working this time. So we're in a different era. It's a much more serious era. We've had the financial bubble crash, and that was anticipated and predicted by all the Austrian economists. But now what we're facing is a dollar crisis, the collapse of the currency. And when that happens, it's worldwide because everybody holds them in, in, the, in reserve banks. 
And even today, commodity prices are going up, interest rates are starting to creep up, and the markets, you stock market might be going up a bit and all, but it's very, very shaky. Because when you look at what's happened to the housing market, there's still a lot of problems there. And it's, ex it's expected not to be solved. We got into this mess because we spent too much money. The debt was too high. We borrowed too much money. We regulated too much. And we had the Federal Reserve monetize everything. So they finally said, yeah, this is really serious. We have to do something about this and get our house in order. So they increased the spending, increased the deficits, increased the borrowing, increased the regulations, and increased the printing of the money. And that was supposed to solve the problem. It's like, it's like a drug addict that's out of his mind with drugs. So he said, well, what you need are more drugs. And uh, for a while, you know, the addict or the alcoholic feels a little bit better, you know, when they have start to get withdrawal symptoms and they feel better. But what happens is you finally kill the patient if you don't get them off the addiction. And we've been addicted <coughs> to living beyond our means. Individuals can't live beyond their means. Nations get away with it for a long time. But eventually, we're called to task and we have to live within our means. And that's what we're witnessing today. So what I see as a solution is first looking to our traditions because it's not like we have to invent something new. We don't have to say, well, you know, we, we've had this interventionist Keynesian economy and fiat money and it's been an experiment for all these years. We have to have something new. Well, they've had experience off and on for centuries on this and they've had experience with tyranny and authoritarianism for centuries. We've only had a short example of an experiment with true liberty. Not perfect, but true liberty by our Constitution that we followed created the freest and the most prosperous country in the history of the world, and we've rejected it. We have, we have failed to defend those principles. It has created, the way I look at this is, it created so much wealth that wealth became the driving force that uh, the material benefits were all that we cared about. So when people come to Washington, they're there to just to divvy up the loot. And you get away with that for a long time because we're so wealthy. But in doing that and ignoring the principles of sound money and limited government and property rights, by eliminating that, finally the productivity goes down and you run out of you run out of the goods and services that you can spread around. So just passing another law because people are, are losing their jobs and they don't have houses and, all right, more people on food stamps, more free medical care, more free education. They just go on and on thinking that that's going to be the solution. And it isn't. What we have to do is restore our confidence in a free society. We have to understand what it is. We have to know that uh, it involves most of what we knew in our traditions. The founders knew something about inflation. That's why I said only gold and silver. You cannot print money. You cannot emit bills of credit. They knew about contracts. They knew about civil liberties and personal liberties. They knew about foreign policy. He said, stay out of these entangling alliances. Uh, no adventurism. Stay at home. Defend the country. But trade with people and be friends with people. But uh, stay out of these, these um, uh, you know, internal affairs of other nations. We totally ignored it. And now... Now our presidents become more arrogant every time we get a new president. This particular president says about war, we don't even have to tell you about going to war. Now that we're in another war in Libya, not that we didn't have enough on our hands. You know, we had we had Iraq, and then we had Afghanistan. We constantly bombed Pakistan. You know, they get annoyed about that, and, uh, <laughs> like we would get annoyed if they were doing it to us. So now, where are we going? We're going over into uh, into Libya and participating there, and uh, we've already spent a billion dollars in the last couple of weeks just in Libya, and we don't have any money. I mean, it's it's insane what's <coughs> happening. Oh yeah, we've got to protect our interests. Well, how many of you have an interest over in Libya that you need us to go over there? If you have interest in Libya and you want to protect them, maybe you ought to go over there and protect them. But. <laughs> But it will come to an end. Uh, you, you'd think the message of uh, Afghanistan would be so loud and clear. You know, the Soviet system was brought down over Afghanistan. It was the, that was the final blow. 
they broke down and the system collapsed. It came for economic reasons. So I lived through and, and uh, was very much aware of the Cold War. The Cold War ended with a whimper. We didn't have to fight the Soviets because they had an economically flawed system. And we have an economically flawed system. Fortunately, we are not nearly as authoritarian as the, as the Soviet system was. But we're becoming more authoritarian all the time, and that bothers me. And the best, the, the tool that is used by those who want to move toward authoritarianism, always use fear. So if there's any reason to be fearful, scare the people, and they'll do our bidding. And uh, there's a lot of reasons that have been concerned on 9-11, which we all were and all should have been, and we should have studied, and we should have learned what, what was the real cause from that. But because of the fear, what did we do right afterwards? Three, what, a week or two afterwards? We had the Patriot Act passed, a huge legislation attacking and really making sure we're going to get the terrorists. It was an attack on you. It was destroying the Fourth Amendment and saying that if we watch every single American and now we start prodding and putting our hands down on the fingers of little girls at the airport, that all of a sudden we're going to be safer? I mean, we've given up too easily. And, and I heard too often after 9-11, that, oh, you have to do that. You have to give up some of your uh, liberties for your safety. And I don't believe that. I don't think you should ever give up any liberty. <laughs> Besides, I have such confidence in a free society that I think a pretty good way for all of us to be saved is to fully understand the Second Amendment. And, uh, <laughs> but you know, um, the, the stage was set. Uh, I've said before, I probably won't go into detail, but I believe our foreign policy has a lot to do with the reason people want to come over here and kill us. They don't want to come and kill us because we're free and prosperous. But we had already lost our way because uh, the responsibility of security on the airlines was the government already. And they said, never resist uh, anybody, a hijacker, and, you can't, and pilots weren't allowed to have guns. So this setting was stayed, and, and, and you know, it was perfect for those who wanted to do what they, what they did. But in, in a free society, the airlines would be treated more like a armored car that picks up the money. You know, they have guns, and they have, you, you know, protection, and there's better, they protect the money better than they protect the people. The airlines should be responsible. Then th these, these rules on violations and what we do for safety would be so different. It wouldn't be the government doing this thing. But once we become totally government dependent on the government, all it will do is cost a lot of money, ruin our civil liberties, and uh, not achieve anything, especially if we don't look you know, at, at our foreign policy. So obviously, on that uh, few days after 9-11, it wasn't very easy because of the political pressure to vote against the Patriot. I thought it was an atrocious piece of legislation. So we are now, you know, uh, <laughs> we make attempts to uh, get rid of it and, and, make, and, and change some of those things, but uh, it, it doesn't happen. The momentum is still very strong. But it will only come when the people of this country decide there's too much of that. We want our liberties back. We want our responsibilities back. We don't want uh, all this warmongering going overseas and that uh, we can be made safe a lot differently than we have been now. Uh, today, you, you know, um, we, uh, we have a president that took us to war. He says, well, the reason I didn't go to the Congress is I got my authority from the United Nations. Well, when did that happen? What well, started with Truman. You know, but I have a solution for that. I'd like to get my bill passed and say, why don't we just get out of the United Nations? <laughs> so we uh, are dependent on internationalism in the worst sense. A true free market person doesn't disdain internationalism or globalism, but it has to be voluntary, it has to be trade, it has to be friendly. It, it can't be internationalism controlled by international governments. You know, here we have the IMF and the World Bank and the WTO and the 
uh, NAFTA and CAFTA and all these government organ international government organizations. I would call all of those organizations entangling alliances that I would just assume stay out of all of them. But how does it get financed? Of course, we borrow money, we tax people. We can't tax anymore. Revenues are going down because the economy is so weak. You put on a tax now, the economy is going to get a lot weaker. So taxes, even if they tried to raise revenues by raising taxes, they're not going to. Uh, not only will they uh, just weaken the economy and there'll be less productivity, it just drives more people into the underground economy. And uh, because they're trying to survive and take care of their families, and that's what would happen. Well, we, our credit's still pretty good. I don't understand how we deserve credit. And one of the reasons is the rest of the currencies of the world aren't much better. So if you compare, if you compare our money and our dollar to the euro, I mean, do you think you're going to be saved by taking our dollars and putting them in euros? No, that's, that's not going to help much at all. But uh, the the uh, there's a limit to how much borrowing. I was looking at statistics today, and very definitely, the Chinese are not borrowing as much or not lending us as much money and buying treasury bills as they used to. I mean, it's not like they're cutting them off and because they don't want to cause a dollar crash. But they're not buying as many. So the world will start uh, buying it less, which means that interest rates will be uh, pushed, pushed up. So the only thing left for, for uh, the government to do is to work with the Federal Reserve to take this debt and monetize it. And that is create money out of thin air. That, as far as I'm concerned, is counterfeit. And we shouldn't be putting people in jail today, imprisoning people today, because they want to use gold and silver, which is constitutional, and, and legalizing the counterfeit of the government. They, they, tell, they want to charge people that deal with uh, sound money as committing charges. <coughs> they, they've made the charges of fraud and uh, terrorist charges and counterfeiting because they want to use gold and silver as money. But paper money... That's counterfeit money, and that's fraud, and that's unconstitutional. But I tell you, I'm convinced it's going to come to an end because there's a limit. No paper currency, you know, lasted for long, long periods of time. Now, this one's 40 years, probably, uh, you know, getting near its last legs. Uh, that is a major crisis when that happens. Because just spending the money, you know, we're, we were down there this week, we have two big bills, the CR and, and the budget, uh, just uh, as a bit of information, I did not vote for the CR, continue resolution, I did, vote for the did not vote for the budget because I don't think it'll do anything. <laughs> this, year, this year, the national debt's going to about $2 trillion, and they're talking about $38 million uh, cut in SCR, which wasn't real, it was all fictitious, and it, it's, it's nothing. Uh, and uh, that, that's why this will have to come to an end. We don't know exactly when, there was no way, no way you can predict it. There was no way for us to know the day the housing bubble would burst, but we knew it was coming and it did. Uh, and the dollar, it'll be some event somewhere uh, in the world, uh, uh, unknown to us now, that will finally just motivate people to get out uh, out of the dollar. But they're slowly getting out of the dollar. People don't want to run to other currencies, but where are they running right now? I mean, uh, buying silver coins. A few people doing that. A few people. <laughs> dollar one time was one twentieth of an ounce of gold. Now it's one fifteen hundredth of an ounce of gold almost. I mean, this it's I think at record highs right now. Not the high price of gold, record low for the value of the dollar. That that is what's happening. So there's a limit to that. And there's a pretty good there's pretty good evidence that there's never been a war fought without inflation. Even in ancient times, because they would inflate uh, by clipping coins or diluting the metals and they always uh, you know, undermine the value of the currency in order to fight wars. Today it's more sophisticated <clears throat> because they just created it. We, we talk about printing money. They don't actually print. A, they print a lot, but that's not it. They just use a computer. And uh, 
right now we're starting to get some real evidence uh, from from the Fed. We 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 had a token victory on finding more about the Fed in the last six months than we have in the whole time since they've been existing. We didn't get our audit the Fed bill passed, but we got it partially passed, and I'm still working on the fact that we need a full audit of the federal government. The American people knew, and the stories are coming out, exactly the shenanigans going on and who got the bailouts. You know, the people who ripped us off and made all this money, all that speculation and all the derivatives market, they made their bucks, then they go bust, and then we, the taxpayers, get stuck with their worthless assets and the Treasury bottom as well as the uh, Federal, Federal Reserve. They buy these assets and... <coughs> The guys that are making all the money, they got bailed out. But the economy gets weaker, people lose their jobs, they lose their mortgages, they lose their houses. It's not geared toward the average person. This whole thing is geared to taking care of big banks, big corporations, the military industrial complex, world bankers. We have now evidence that it could be up to between 30 and 50% of all the trillions of dollars they used to bail out in the crisis that the Fed passed out, went to overseas banks. There's one bank that got a big bailout. One third of the bank was owned by Gaddafi. I mean, that's how insane it is. Oh yeah, we have to calm the markets and take care, you know, all this thing. But uh, they're doing it at the expense of the average person because Penalty is paid with higher prices. And if any of your prices have started to go up, just think tax, 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 inflationary tax, the value of the currency, gasoline, and everything else, it's, it's going to go up. It's going to go up a lot more. And uh, that will not be able And Bernanke keeps saying, I can take care of it. When I know it's there, I will know the very instant to take the, you know, to take the money back and raise the interest rates. Well, he doesn't know. He was the same one that said there was no fire, no housing bubble. So he's going to get us out of this mess. There's no way that's going to happen. But just changing the manager of the Federal Reserve to try to get a better manager of the money system, that's not going to work. I don't imagine you can find much worse, anybody worse than Bernanke, but it won't help because, because it's the system. And it's the system that we have to change. And it's also the reason my position on the Fed is and the Federal Reserve. <laughs> so in, in this uh, freedom philosophy that I talk about and believe so strongly in, I believe it's an American tradition. I believe it's uh, embedded in our Constitution if we did follow it. But basically, it's a uh, pretty clear cut. Um, you know, non interventionist foreign policy. People say, oh, you're an isolationist. No, I'm not an isolationist. You know, I want to trade with people and, and visit with people, but just not fight with people unnecessarily. And, uh, but it would be non intervention, and uh, that would be one part that I think would be so important. The other, of course, is. Uh, uh, based on free markets, uh, the, the uh, free market system where transactions are voluntary, contracts are very important, you have sound, sound money. Uh, today though, instead of the government protecting and enforcing our contracts, the government's always breaking our contracts. And they're imposing the rules and regulations on the contract. And how about property? They're supposed to protect the value of, or our private property to be ours and make our decisions. But just try to use your property. If, and you have to get permits, not only from your local people, your state people. You have to go to the federal government. You've got to talk to about 10 agencies down in Washington before you can even use your own land. But you get charged a lot of taxes. If you don't do it, they take away your land. So there are times I think we just pay rent for our land. I'd say we need to take our property back and say it's our property. We're not hurting anybody else. Area where uh, many conservatives uh, get lackadaisical is on the personal liberties issue. I I like to look at the personal liberties and the economic liberties as being the same, and I think the founders did. They didn't have liberty over here for how you spend your money, but not on your personal habits. It's all one thing. But the problem with 
it with saying, you know, with the liberal, they say, well, oh no, uh, if you just if you don't have rules and regulations on redistribution, well, people are going to fall through the cracks, and there won't, you know, be enough to go around. So we've got to make sure we take care of them. But the conservative comes along and said, yeah, but if they have total liberty, they might do some things that I don't approve of. Horrors, you know. <laughs> but the rule is, is your life. You can waste it or you can use it, but it's up to you to what you want to do with it, just as long as you don't hurt anybody else with what you do personally or what you do with your property, and then it's none of the government's business. <laughs> Americans are pretty good on the First Amendment. You know, most people would agree, you know, the First Amendment there is for freedom of expression. And we have that pretty much. I can come up here and, and cautiously express my views. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we don't have to fear anything. But we don't have the First Amendment. And most people recognize this. We don't have the First Amendment so that we can talk about the weather. You know, we have the First Amendment to talk about controversial things and say controversial express controversial ideas and criticize our, our leaders and all everybody everybody knows that. Um, but and we know that it applies to our religion. You can have no religion or a lot of religion, as long as you don't force it on other people. We're not to have a theocracy and uh, And we know that we shouldn't meddle with our intellectual life. We know that the government shouldn't meddle with our religious life. And our religious life has to deal with something pretty important, like our eternity and our salvation. And we get to make our own choices what we do on that matter. But then when it comes to drinking raw milk, you have to have the government tell you whether or not you can drink raw milk. And, and what not. Or what you smoke and drink and what the, the whole works. Anything that goes into a mouth is up for grabs at all levels of government. They think they can tell us. And I said, no. <laughs> and uh, the, these habits, whether they're eating habits or smoking habits or whatever, they, these problems can be solved with private property rights, with you know, like allowing restaurants to make their own rules rather than coming in and closing people down and saying, oh, you lit a cigarette here the other day, you're closing us down, and you know, all that. And I, I don't like, uh, obviously, the cigarettes, and I don't like the drugs or anything. But I'll tell you what, as bad as I don't like those drugs, I really don't like the drug war. I think it's much more dangerous. <laughs> in the drug wars than they die from the drugs. Matter of fact, more people die from prescription drugs than they do from the illegal drugs. So they're not doing very much good by, uh, by uh, having, uh, having the drugs legalized either. But we, we, have, um, we have a tremendous task ahead of us. And we don't have the same attitude that we had when they wanted to make alcohol illegal. You know, they thought, that's pretty good. It's been, they worked for 50, 60, 70 years to get the country to agree that alcohol is bad stuff. And I agree with them, alcohol is bad. So they come along and they say, well, we're going to prohibit it because we're going to stop people from practicing these bad habits and they have bad consequences. But what did they do? They amended the Constitution. Can you imagine anybody today suggesting we have to amend the Constitution to run the drug war? Drug war was started in the early, the modern day drug war was started in basically in the early 70s. And they have spent hundreds of billions of dollars on the drug war. We have more prisoners than anybody else in the world. And we have a lot of people who were put into these prisons. They're not, they were non-violent, and they come out very violent. So I say that it's time we allow people to make their own choices and suffer their own consequences if they make bad choices and can't Freedom is something that we all believe in and understand and want to protect. Freedom was tested best in this country, better than any other country in the world. And yet, today, it's slipping away. It's an early experiment. Most of history has been run by tyrants. Most people in Washington are authoritarians. In either one area, some area, they're authoritarians. And they want to tell other people what to do, and they don't think their job 
is about one thing, and that is the protection of liberty. That is what we should do. people have lost confidence that freedom really works. Uh, we've been taught so long that there'll be so many people suffering, there'll be no medical care and no food, and you have to have people falling through the cracks, and on and on. But you know, when a society decides that the very needy have to be taken care of by governments, that's very benign. Well, it's just a couple people. Well, you can't be against it, nobody is. And they say, we we must take from you to take care of, care of these few people over here that need some help. But what happens is it, it endorses an idea that is destined to grow. And after 30, 40, or 50 years, you destroy their productivity, and those who become dependent grow and grow. So now today we have 42 million people on food stamps. And everybody depends on the government now for their medical care. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk and a lot of complaint. I'm sure this crowd probably is not too happy with Obamacare, but uh, but you know we we should at least have the chance to opt out of those systems. I'd like to be able to opt out of all those government programs. <laughs> the other thing that I tell uh, a lot of people, and especially the young people. If they get worried that this sounds too radical and they hear the story, well, in order to solve this problem, you're not realistic, you've got to be realistic, and you've got to be willing and get up on the on, on line. You've got to, everybody has to sacrifice. And I just don't think that's necessary because if you got your freedom back and you didn't have to pay taxes and the government was out of your life, um, why, why, would you, why would that be a sacrifice? It's the people who are receiving from government, the people who are receiving the bailouts, the military industrial complex, all the foreign expenditures, they're the ones who have had to sacrifice. But I don't think the average person would have to sacrifice anything in, in order to get by. But uh, you know, today, um, I think we're seeing some changes, very positive changes. I think people are starting to recognize that we have a mess. I think people are starting to talk about the Federal Reserve. They're talking about these endless wars. They're sick and tired of reading in the news about us participating in torture and now assassination of American citizens. That's actually been said to be legal by this president. People are hearing this and they're getting tired of it. They're getting tired of the economy. But I believe there's a new generation coming alive right now that believes differently and that we're moving into a very positive era. We're moving into an era that we're going to reject the government nanny state where they're going to take care of us because they're not going to be able to. Even those who have been receiving entirely, <laughs> receiving from the government, are starting to realize, you know, there's an end to this. What's going to happen? Because they're looking at these debts. You can't have $2 trillion debt increase every year. And uh, once you see prices going up and interest rates going up, that's going to be a huge tax. So people are knowing about it. And I am very pleased when I come to the universities and I go whenever I get a chance because the changes will come from the universities. The changes will come when you change ideas. The politicians, you cannot depend on the politicians in Washington to solve your problem. You have to do it in an intellectual climate. We have to repeal Keynesianism. That's what we have to do. revolution and it's a revolution in, in ideas and when a true revolution comes it is intellectual and invades the universities and invades the media it, inv it invades the culture then it eventually invades uh, you know the political the, the political system but it won't be a partisan thing if you say it's only the Republicans that we have in Congress today they're going to solve our problems that's not going to happen. It's going to have to be a revolution in ideas, and the ideas will be the ideas of liberty. And that means that for this to work, you have to build coalitions, not compromising anything, but building coalitions, because there are people all across the political spectrum. Some believe in civil liberties, some believe against, you know, they oppose the foreign intervention, other believes in the market. You need to bring all these people together and say, this is one entity, it's, it's liberty. It is liberty that we have to defend because the whole purpose from my personal viewpoint for liberty is for us 
personally to work for uh, excellence and virtue. That should be a goal in life. That's my goal in life. But it's best done in a free society. And that means that liberty is the goal. Yes, we want sound money and the foreign policy and all these policy changes, but all those policies come together and they make common sense if the goal is to recognize that you are an entity, a very important entity, you have a right to your life and you have a right to your liberty and you have a right to be left alone. And those rights do not come from the government, but they come in a natural or God-given way. If we recognize that, I am convinced we can solve all our problems. questions. Is that correct? Yeah. If, if it is the case, I either need a mic or make sure I hear the question so I can figure out what the answer is. Uh, Dr. Paul, I just want to point out when somebody says, that's not unconstitutional. Don't you know the United States Supreme Court upheld that? I like to say, please explain why you agree with that ruling. And with those eight words, you can introduce the concept of thinking for themselves. Uh, I found a hidden loophole in the Electoral College process that I'd like to pass along to you, and I'll pass it up to your wife up here. She'll make sure I read it. Huh? <laughs> she might win. <laughs> okay, question over here. Yeah, Dr. Paul. Um, I had learned that we used to be a republic. Now, if you talk to even most college students, they think we're just a democracy. So number one, I think we need educate, more education on what we should be. But my question to you is, um, how do you think we could get back to making the federal government smaller, like it was intended to be, and get the states back their sovereignty? She asked, how do we get this job done, and how do we work back to smaller and limited government, and also emphasize the fact that we aren't uh, a democracy, but we are a republic. Of course, when we have the people understanding those terms in our history and the Constitution, then uh, we get rid of about 80% of everything the federal government's doing, and, and we'd all be safer and happier. <laughs> I think your point about democracy is so important because all the presidents use it, it's used so care carelessly. I mean, we have democratic elections, but that doesn't make us a, a democracy. Uh, democracy is uh, is uh, a dictatorship of the majority, and that is an abuse of all minority uh, rights. But even the democratic process, if you just bend a little bit on the definition of democracy, you know, what, what was one of the major excuses for going over into Iraq? To spread American democracy. We got to teach them how to be good, uh, good de Democrats. Uh, Oh, and by the way, one of the first things that they got the uh, rebels in Libya to set up, I mean, they were only in business a week or two, they had them set up a central bank. <laughs> but no, we go overseas, we kill a lot of people over there, a lot of our people get killed, and we're going to impose on them, you know, you know this neo-Jacobinism idea that we're going to force you to be good people. At the same time, even the democratic process here is very weak in this country, because if any of you have ever come to the conclusion that there's not a whole lot of difference on the results of whether you have a Republican or a Democrat, then you say, well, where's the alternative? Well, you hardly have one. Oh, yeah, it's legal. You can go out and start the Libertarian Party or Conservative Party. Yeah, but, but can you get on ballots easily? Can you get into the debates? Can you get the recognition? No, it's, it's all shunned. So we die to spread democracy over de overseas, where I think we can learn a lot about taking care of our own business at home. Representative Paul, I have a question about the money going to Libya via the Federal Reserve. I was very disturbed when I read that on your Texas Straight Talk uh, last week. Why will no one at the Federal Reserve be held accountable for that? Because the Federal Reserve is a government unto itself. They're very, very powerful. and uh, But they're also on the defensive, more so than they've ever been before. They've been able to do everything in secret, but Fortunately for the two lawsuits uh, uh, by uh, 
see, uh, it was Bloomberg and Fox, that they did force some of the information out. And because we had a modification of my bill last year, we're getting some more information in July. Uh, it does fall on me with some of the responsibility, you know, in the committee to bring this to light. And we will do our very best. But um, unfortunately, it's going to be very, very difficult. They are very powerful. And if you think about it, they, they have more economic, political clout than the whole Congress. They, they spent $3.3 trillion on those bailouts, you know, and the Congress spent $850 billion, you know. And it's all done in secret. Yes, they should be held accountable. And uh, some of the stories coming out here on who's, getting, who's gotten these loans, uh, they should be and hopefully they can be, but the odds of them really being held accountable, um, I'm, I, I wish I could be more optimistic. But the best way to hold them accountable is as this system falls apart that we intellectually blame them. Uh, they, they've had a free ride. They've always said that the, if the economy is doing well, the Fed has managed the money supply right and the interest rates are exactly what they should be and that's why we have a growing economy. But then the economy would turn down because of the Federal Reserve, then the Fed would come in and say, well, what we need to do is print more money and rescue people who are in, a, you know, in trouble. And they generally got credit for getting us back out of the, out of the slump. But that's not going to happen anymore. They have to be blamed because they are responsible intellectually. The legal responsibility is another matter. I, uh, I, I think it, we should pursue that, but I'm not very optimistic that much will happen. Congressman Paul, thanks for coming to speak with us tonight. Can you share with us your view on immigration? I, I can. Um, I, I do have a little book coming out, uh, and it's called Liberty Be Fine, and I spent a lot of time on immigration, trying to work it out. And it's really not one of the easiest subjects to deal with, because you have, and I start off with saying there are two extremes. You have a, a, an extreme libertarian view they said there should be no borders and people can come and go and go wherever they want. And then there's the other viewpoint that you should have barbed wire fences and guns and soldiers and you shoot them, shoot anybody that's coming over. And I don't accept either one of those. Matter of fact, I think you, just to answer the pure libertarian approach, if we truly had a libertarian society and all the property was owned by private individuals, it could end up to be a pretty close society. The property owner would have to give permission to that individual coming in. But that's not where we are today. It's not going to happen. But where we are today is we have a lot of illegal uh, immigrants in this country. Uh, I have proposed legislation. My position is that uh, they should not qualify for welfare. They shouldn't get... Uh, matter of fact, they come over from Mexico on a day basis into the valley and go to public school and then go back. But that, that's uh, suicidal because the schools are all bankrupt too and hospitals have had to be closed down because they get free medical care. Uh, our welfare, and I work in economics, the welfare state encourages a lot of our people not to work. You know, if, if you didn't work, you didn't eat, people might take a job for $4 an hour. But who's going to take a job for four or five or six dollars an hour if they can get seven fifty on welfare? You know, they're not going to do it. So the welfare system weakens the economy, puts people on welfare. They're not as easy to take the jobs, and then the welfare inducement come over. Oh, I can bring my family. <laughs> you know, and they get free medical care and, and free education. Uh, I'm also convinced that if you had a free market economy and sound money, it would be thriving. We would be looking for immigrants. You know, we would, we would need them and, and want them because you would need workers and uh, it wouldn't be a burden at all. Under today's circumstances, many times we scapegoat and say, well, it's those Mexicans coming over here and they're causing all our, all our problems. As far as what I would do with um, how many, 12, 15, nobody knows how many illegal immigrants are in this country. Well, I don't believe in giving them, uh, um, you know, amnesty and giving them citizenship. But at the same time, it's, you're not, no matter how strongly you feel about it, you're not going to round up 15 million people and send them someplace because I've seen examples 
A lot of them have lived all their life here and they're still illegal. And they're in families that are partially legal. So that that is not going to work. But I would not give them a citizenship. Matter of fact, I think people coming over and they get the, the citizenship uh, and you have to work out a tra transition. This is just a suggestion. If you and I had to wait 18 years before we could vote, maybe they ought to wait till 18 years before they can vote. But there's a big motive, you know, for, for political reasons to bring the immigrants in and legalize them to get them voting in a certain direction. And I don't think that's right either. But believe me, liberty would solve this problem because people wouldn't be as concerned if, uh, if the economy was thriving and they were looking for workers. But uh, that's, that's a brief outline. <laughs> Who is next? Here. Welcome to New Hampshire. Spring's finally here, so hopefully the weather's good for you. I've um, been reading a lot of legislation for the past few years and have to say that uh, four words in every bill that I have read just make me scratch my head. Um, look worried. Everybody should be worried. And for other purposes. Um, I applaud you and thank you. I know that our, our previous representative from the first district didn't agree with you. Nobody else did in Congress. You'd obviously read the bill on Haiti that uh, established a permanent military base. I thought that was an exception. Every other bill I've seen, it says for end for other purposes. How can we get that out of uh, legislation moving forward so that bills are for what they're stated for? Well, I, I, I have to look at the particular bill when they do that, but you're, you're right. It's open-ended. And uh, unfortunately, that's the way they like things. But uh, it's just a matter of the individuals. Uh, you know, uh, you trying to educate your congressman and you running for Congress and making sure you don't do it and things like that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm wondering about the fact that the Federal Reserve Board sets the interest rates four times a year or something like that? No, um, more often. More often. You said earlier that interest rates will rise. How can they rise if the Federal Reserve has set them? Okay. Interest rates, uh, it, interest rates are, in a way, set by the Federal Reserve constantly. Although lately they've been rather stable because they're at zero. They can't go, they can't go any lower. Uh, so they're they're price fixers. And the worst thing you can do is to fix the price of anything because that'll cause shortages. And you need pricing to know what. That's why socialism always fails. You don't have a pricing structure. And one half of our economy is our money, and the Fed's in there fixing overnight interest rates. They don't fix all the rates. They don't, they don't sit there and say how much you're going to pay on your credit card. So it's, it's for the big guys who get the deals. Low interest rates. Matter of fact, since the crisis has been over, the Fed gives free money to the banks. The banks go and they buy treasury bills. They make 2 or 3%. And all of a sudden, they're making a lot of money. The economy doesn't grow. They're not making loans. And they say, oh, we're paying back all our loans already. But uh, no, they, they fix, um, they, they, uh, they take this authority that they can fix overnight rates. That means well, how the banks have to maintain their reserves and uh, what they can borrow and how much, they, how much they have to pay if they go to the discount window. Uh, so that has a lot of influence. But the main flaw is that they, uh, they engender lower interest rates than the market, and that is why businessman does the wrong thing and the investor does the wrong thing and that's why you had a financial uh, bubble. But uh, they don't have a set time like every four times a year they sit down and do the interest rate. They might, you know, there are certain times when uh, it used to be every month they would change it, you know, the, the interest rates. But that's one of the principles of a free market. You, you shouldn't do that. It helps the banks, but what if you're a saver? What if you're a little skittish about all this and, and you put your money in in a savings account and you're elderly and you want to protect your savings, you don't want to in invest in stocks. Uh, you get, what, 2% or 1%? You know, at, at, the, same, at, uh, at the same time, uh, you, if you had market interest rates, see, when the interest rates are, uh, you, you know, if the person is saving, that will adjust the interest rates. But, so the savers get punished, which means you're messing up the whole capitalist system because savings are key to capitalism. You shouldn't be able to create so-called capital out of thin air and pass it out and have interest rates low. When interest rates are low, that means there are no savings. 
But we had very low interest rates. That was under uh, uh, under Greenspan. Very low interest rates. At the same time, there was all the money, uh, and there was no savings. We weren't saving, so it's a distortion. So they should be out of the business of fixing interest rates. So, but they also should be out of the business if you don't get rid of them overnight. Just make sure they can't buy all that government debt. That's where the problem is. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Paul. Um, my name is Christopher Gosselin. Um, if you just bear me work with me for a moment, I flew 29 hours from uh, South Korea. I'm stationed in the military there. And um, I just want to come here today to give you something. And um, I want to tell you, I've been working for you since uh, 2007 when I saw you cream Rudy Giuliani in that debate. And you I read some of those quotes that you put on a summer reading list, and I like that. I, uh, I hope you got some of them. But um, I came here today, and uh, like I said, I've been campaigning for you. Even though you're not in the Oval Office, uh, we all think that you should be. And, uh, and uh, I just want to let you know that when I speak to people and I talk on your behalf and the, and the points of liberty that I believe in, people say, yeah, that's a, those are great ideas. The economic liberty, the educational liberty, the liberty that we can have so we can have this green revolution that you know so many young people want. But they say, those things aren't tangible, they aren't here. How do we bring them about? And people are necessarily on board with, with what we're saying, and they're on board with these, these voices of liberty, but how do we bring it about so that they could, they could actually see it in their minds, because it's not there. How do we make them yeah. see it? And the final thing is, is I want to give this to you. I'm sorry, I don't have anything for Carol. Are you here to announce today that you're going to run for president in 2012? then what do we do about it? And a lot of young people will come, exactly what should I do tomorrow? Should I run for Congress? Should I do this or this? And you know, the answer is, do whatever you want. You know, do what you have to do. Do what you know how to do. You obviously are already doing something. You know, everybody does something. Um, by doing nothing, you're doing something, and that's probably wrong. <laughs> but let me tell you, if you've made it to this lecture here, and you generally agree with it, and if it's new to you, your life should be different. But your life should be different anyway if you accept these views. Because you're in a unique category. Because most people never care. You know, they let them vote, but they might not care until, you know, a week or two before the election or something. But no, everybody has a responsibility, more so when you know where the trouble is and you believe you know some answers. But it's still back to what do you do about it? Well, uh, an individual can run for office, support other people, get an education, get into the media, get into teaching, you know, all kinds of different things, whatever it comes. Might be just talking to your neighbors, you, you know, whatever start. You know, in the campaign that we had before, it was so spontaneous that, you know, I had never heard this term, meetup groups. You know, all of a sudden, meetup groups were all over the place. And now I think there's something called Facebook or something like that. <laughs> I mean, there's an opportunity to spread messages. The Internet is fantastic. And it's so much more than when I was in college and uh, in the early years in politics that you couldn't spread this message. But the energy from young people, I think, is just fantastic. So, uh, but with the particular job, is, it's going to be difficult. But one thing I like to work on in Washington, because I don't believe, you know, that legislatively we're all of a sudden going to see this change. I'm not going to get the law passed that says we're going to abolish the Fed. The Fed's going to abolish itself when it's, you know, uh, self-destruct. But what I always work on, and we could do this in education, medicine, and in money, and that is get the, keep the right to opt out. You know, if you're unhappy with your educational system, we always, whether you're in public schools or not, you always ought to argue the case that you have the personal responsibility and the right to opt out of a public education system, teach at home or teach in private schools, because if we lose that, we lose an awfully lot. And there are people in Washington who would just as soon not have the independent-minded people in, in the homeschoolers and private schooling. Obama 
Obamacare and people say, well, we'd like to opt out. If we could just be able to opt out. But you know, there was a big fuss of opting out of Obamacare, but can you really opt out of Medicare? I mean, people are driven in America. I remember when my dad became 65 and he was annoyed because it sort of pressures you into it. It's very hard to be self-reliant with these laws, but they also always should protect it. Uh, our chance to do something else on our own and assume responsibility. So in medicine, it should be the medical savings account. Deduct everything you spend on medicine, take it off your taxes, and you take care of yourself and not depend on the government. In the money issue, I work and I have bills in, and we're going to have things going on in the subcommittee about competition in currencies. Just legalize your right to use currencies in a golden store. In order to legalize uh, another uh, gold and silver, you shouldn't ever have to pay sales taxes on buying your money. And you shouldn't have to pay capital gains tax in case your money goes up in value. And then you could use your money as a currency. You should. Okay. One more question, I believe. Oh, you have liberty, uh, Dr. Paul. But I was wondering with the non interventionist policy, um, how should the U.S. react to uh, egregious human rights abuses? And, uh, I'm not sorry, I missed what, uh, to react to um, egregious like, uh, human rights abuses and uh, genocides in foreign countries where um, a lot of people who, whether you agree with uh, intervention or not, um, that's their liberty and their right to uh, simply exist is being threatened. Yes, and obviously those things go on, um, but our government, you know, like Rwanda, things are going on and we totally ignored it. And I wouldn't have advocated taxing you or sending you over there to solve that problem. So you know, our government, I would say, should stay out of it. But uh, calling attention to it, and Americans have been very generous in trying to help people who have had problems. But to use uh, force and violence to tax and force people in this country to go over there and try to work out these problems, uh, I don't believe we have the moral and legal right to do it. I don't think it generally works, because even when you have a humanitarian instinct and our government sends food to these countries, usually you're just giving you know, the factions a weapon because they use it against each other. All foreign aid, for whatever reason, whether humanitarian or not, I think it represents nothing more than taking money from poor people in this country and giving it to the rich people in those poor countries who happen to be dictators. expanded the Bush doctrine a little bit. Bush said you can go to war because uh, uh, it prevented war. Prevented war, as far as I'm concerned, is like aggression. You just go, oh, you might be going to do us harm someday. We're going to come here and bomb you and take you over. But Obama's taking it one step further. He's saying, yes, even for humanitarian reasons. You know, at least we were trying. Oh, the, uh, the Iraqis are going to, you know, come with a nuclear weapon and bomb us. You know, that sort of fear-mongering. And Obama just said, oh, no, you know, uh, um, Gaddafi might hurt some of his people, uh, and therefore we have to go over and preemptively start another war, and we don't even have to ask the Congress. We are every year getting worse on that, so that's why these principles are so important. Was there one more question behind you there? Or, no, I think that'll do it, and I thank you very much. <laughs>